Miracles. The pages of the Bible are filled with them, from Adam and Eve to Jesus and the Apostles. But are miracles a thing of the past? Or does the hand of God still intervene in the modern world, and more importantly, in our everyday lives? It's a commonly held belief that God does not intervene in the affairs of men today. It isn't that He can't. He just doesn't. Do miracles still happen today? In a world filled with news of violence and tragedy, it's sometimes difficult to accept even the possibility. But what happens if we look beyond the headlines? Modern day miracles absolutely do happen on the earth today. There's no doubt about that. God never stopped doing miracles. Are there untold stories of miracles waiting to be found? even in the most unlikely of places? For many, the September 11th terrorist attacks marked one of the darkest days in recent history. Some even point to these events as proof that God no longer intervenes in the lives of human beings. But what if we could find evidence of the miraculous, even here? Might that be enough to silence the skeptics? After the attacks, amazing stories began to emerge from the ashes, stories of survival that defy explanation, and heroic deeds that move one to tears. Do they provide proof that miracles can happen in the modern day? Might we even find evidence that a greater number of miracles occurred on September 11 than on any other single day in history? And what deeper message lies in the accounts of the people who should have died that day, yet somehow, through unexplainable circumstances, lived to tell the tale? Can luck account for their survival? Or was it something more? Our search for answers begins in just a moment. What is a miracle? Something that happens every day, like a new life being brought into the world? Or something rare, like being healed of an incurable disease? Or could it be that the only true miracles are those that happen under the most extreme circumstances? We're living in an age where one need only turn on the television to be bombarded by proof of all the evil in the world. But where is the evidence for miracles? Does God still intervene in our lives? Many Christians have been asking themselves these questions, especially since that dark day in the fall of 2001 when evil took center stage. Through our television screens, it seems all the world witnessed the horrific events of September 11th the haunting and tragic images will live with us forever. But what about the people who were caught up in the actual events? Could it be that their own personal stories reveal something unexpected? Are their lives a living testimony to the miraculous? By all logical accounts, the people you're about to meet should not be alive today, but they are. Was it luck that saved them? Skeptics would love to call it that, but these survivors see things differently. They believe they were saved by a supernatural act. Call it a miracle, divine intervention, or even the hand of God. But according to the people who were there, there's no way you can call it luck. On the morning of September 11th, at 8.46 a.m., the worst terrorist attacks ever to occur on American soil began with a fury. An American Airlines jet crashes into the 110-story North Tower of the World Trade Center. In the South Tower, a red-orange flame catches the eye of Stanley Pramnath, an executive with Fuji Bank. I work on the 81st floor as an assistant vice president in their loan operation area. And our department was on the 
end, the extreme south end of the building, where I said I could have seen the Statue of Liberty. And as I swiveled around the chair, I was overlooking the Hudson, Jersey cities. So on a given day, you look out far out, you see a plane just zoom by. My Bible I took with me, and my Bible was always on top of my desk. So now when I'm walking towards the Statue, Statue of Liberty looking, overlooking, and I'm walking towards my desk, and what I saw was fireballs coming down from the sky. My God, what is happening? See, I was in the elevator coming up. The first building is hit. Didn't hear anything, don't have a clue what is happening outside. So we ran out of the office, ran down the hallway, the elevator went down. When we reached the lobby, all the loudspeakers, you can hear them, your building is safe, is secure, go back to your office. Something is not right. Although he couldn't know it at the time, a chain of events has begun that will put him directly in the path of the ongoing terrorist attack, with no way to escape. With the North Tower in flames, emergency personnel across the city received the call to report to the World Trade Center. The men of Ladder Company No. 6 in New York City's Chinatown District are some of the first to arrive at the scene. The firefighters I had on duty that day uh, were already in. Uh, Matt Komarowski, Mike Meldrum, Sal D'Agostino, Tommy Falco, and Billy Butler. They were all in. About quarter to nine in the morning, uh, we heard a, a loud boom. Right by the Manhattan Bridge, we have a panoramic view of Lower Manhattan. And what, what I saw was unbelievable. You know, we, we saw the, the North Tower of the World Trade Center with large gaping holes in it that, that spanned the entire width of, of the Trade Center, uh, of the North Tower, and uh, spanned about 10 floors. And there was smoke coming out under pressure, and I could, even from that distance I could see flames. This was the most unbelievable sight I ever saw. Before the second plane hits the South Tower, Fuji Bank Executive Stanley Pramnath takes the advice of a security guard and decides to return to his, as yet, undamaged office. And in my heart, something is wrong. I looked at everybody's faces, and they're waiting for me. And half-heartedly, I walk back in that elevator. I got in the elevator, and I'm looking at this lady. She's looking at me, smiling, never realizing that this is the last smile I'd ever have. Moments later, Pramnath is back at his desk, and that's when he sees it. Wait a minute. I'm looking south towards the direction of the Statue of Liberty, and what caught my eyes was this giant airplane. And I can still hear this engine revving as it's getting bigger and closer towards me. Once we got to uh, the World Trade Center, we, we, we parked the fire truck and we started to dismount and getting ready to gather our tools and uh, pieces of the building started falling and hitting our truck. I got to the, uh, the lobby command post and uh, as you can imagine there was a, a line of fire officers awaiting to get their orders. Out of the corner of my eye I saw a large black shadow on the ground outside. I dropped the phone, I screamed, I dove under the desk and all I remember saying was Lord I can't do this, you take over. The plane just crashed into the building, and the bottom wing swiped right through the office. Cut right through. The sound that it made was like boom, and like this big orange flame, sort of. Like a ball of flame, just like juts out through the window. That's all I remember seeing. And the place got like dark after that. We saw flaming pieces of debris falling and uh, large pieces of steel falling. And a man came running in from the outside and uh, said that uh, a second plane has just hit the second tower. At that point, you could have heard a pin drop. And then after that, it was my turn to receive orders. So I, uh, I just went up to the desk and I, and I said, you know, a second plane just hit the second tower. He said, yeah, I know. He says, just Take your guys upstairs and do the best you can. As they climb the stairs of the North Tower, 
Captain Jonas and his men commit themselves to the impossible task of rescuing people trapped on the upper floors. Upon impact, the ceiling caved in, part of the floor collapsed. All the partition, all the walls and everything was flattened. Every piece of furniture and computer was all destroyed. And I'm huddled under that desk screaming, Lord, I don't want to die. Please send somebody, anybody to help me. The nose of the United Airlines jet smashes into Stanley Pramnath's floor and tears through the building. Thousands of gallons of jet fuel ignite to create a hellish inferno. With less than 50 yards between Pramnath's desk and the epicenter of the impact, the banker's chances of survival should be non-existent. Yet when the cataclysmic roar of the crash subsides, Stanley Pramnath is very much alive. How could he possibly have survived? But the only desk that stood for him was the desk that I was under. My Bible's on top of that desk. Help me! But Pramnath's ordeal isn't over yet. Trapped in the wreckage of his office, the banker's only escape route is blocked by flaming debris. Has his unexplainable good fortune finally run out? A deeply committed Christian, Pramnath begs for God to help him. As he prays, something unexpected and possibly even miraculous is taking place all around him. In the World Trade Center, 99% of the people who could survive did survive. That's 99% of the people below the plane crash, which is particularly amazing because even when you talk to those survivors, some of them were severely burned, others um, were caught in the rubble. So there were a lot of ways to die that day. On a day so filled with the tragic loss of life, how could so many people have survived the seemingly unsurvivable? Could it be that hidden within these statistics lies the evidence for thousands of miracles? When we talk about luck or chance, we're talking about fortuitous events or random occurrences. Is it possible that this is what happened at the World Trade Center? After all, a random occurrence is something that to all appearances has no specific pattern or purpose. And yet in this event, we see a pattern emerging. People who should have been in the Trade Center Towers that day ended up being absent, either because of a strange circumstance or their own uncharacteristic decision. And because of this, hundreds of lives were saved. September 11 saw thousands of people emerge from the towering inferno of the World Trade Center buildings frightened but unscathed. While the survival of so many people is certainly cause for celebration, the number of dead and wounded as a result of the terrorist attacks is still sobering. And after the impact of the first plane, the mayhem is not confined to the towers themselves. In the streets below the North Tower, a woman known only as Jane Doe No. 1 lies bleeding to death on the sidewalk. Debris from the first doomed plane has fallen from the sky and nearly severed the legs and lower torso of this unknown victim. Her situation is dire, and as the minutes pass, the stage is set for something unexplainable. But is what happened next truly miraculous? When you're talking about miracles, you really need to define exactly what you mean because many people have a tendency to throw the word miracle around rather carelessly. What some may call a miracle might more accurately be defined as either a coincidence or simply a wonderful experience that could easily be, dis be explained through natural means. But a miracle is really an event or a happening that is inexplainable. It's not common, it's uncommon. It's not predictable, it's unpredictable. It's not ordinary, it's extraordinary. C.S. Lewis defined a miracle as an interference with nature by supernatural power. Is there evidence this occurred on September 11th? Let's return to the case of Jane Doe. Severely wounded by falling debris, the unknown woman is taken to New York University Downtown Medical Center, where Dr. Gerald Ginsburg tends to her wounds. She was totally in shock, practically no blood pressure, incoherent, kind of raving. And I looked at the injury, which was, um, uh, uh, I'll be a little graphic here, uh, but it was the removal of all the skin and the fat from her lower back down to below her buttocks. It was just 
slice off and attached by just a little thread. And then her legs were multiply fractured from the uh, knees down. The woman is taken into surgery where a difficult decision has to be made. As head of the trauma team, the choice to amputate or try to save the patient's legs ultimately lies with Dr. Ginsburg. At this point, I think she'd had about 15 units of blood. And to give you an understanding, there are about seven units of blood in a person to begin with. So she'd had a washout of her total circulation twice. She had very little of her own blood left in her. Uh, I asked the anesthesiologist, can we go ahead? Because you know you can live without your legs. And the worst thing to do surgically is to try to do too good a job and lose the patient. So we needed to decide what's next. The situation seems hopeless. But somewhere inside, a voice tells Dr. Ginsburg he must try. Of course, I'm thinking, who is this woman? No idea who she is or who her family is or what she was doing or even understanding how she was injured. I could only tell you what was injured at this point. And um, she's still bleeding. What happened in the operating room that day? Why would Dr. Ginsburg, a skilled and experienced surgeon, disregard the more conservative choice of amputation and attempt the seemingly impossible instead? Would he be able to accomplish what he set out to do? Or would Jane Doe become one of the many casualties of the terrorist attacks? At 9.38 a.m., American Airlines Flight 77 crashes into the Pentagon and plunges the military nerve center of the United States into a fiery chaos. Inside the Pentagon, Wayne Sinclair is watching news reports of the World Trade Center attacks when the jet hits. It was, it was real sudden. Uh, all you could hear was a, like a big whoosh of wind. We were crawling over the debris, um, crawling, climbing over it as best we could. A lot of file cabinets, a lot of computer debris, uh, walls and live wires. Uh, kind of helped each other climb over some desks. But uh, we were so disoriented, we didn't know which way was out. And you couldn't see anything, it was some dark, you know. Between the, the rubble and the smoke and the, and the fire, you really couldn't see your hand in front of you. It, it was that smoky. One of the guys got disoriented in the smoke and fire, and they found him a day or two later uh, in the rubble. That uh, he just didn't make it. We heard a lot of people, you know, hollering, you know, which way is out, and. and and calling for help to, to get them out. Cause we didn't know which way was out. We had no sense of direction. Actually, we didn't know if we was gonna make it out or not. Trapped inside the burning Pentagon, Wayne Sinclair prays for a savior. But who will come to his rescue? Probably after I got crawling through some of the rubble in the office, we heard the voice that let us out. Well, before we heard the voice, we weren't sure what direction to go because we're so disoriented because nothing looks the same. And you really can't see a whole lot for the, for the smoke and the flames. Uh, I really believe that that was my guardian angel that got me out of the building that day. Wayne and several of his terrified co-workers scrambled toward the mysterious voice. But can they make it out in time? Or will they be overcome by the deadly smoke and flames? When Wayne Sinclair went to work at the Pentagon on September 11th, the thought of divine intervention never entered his mind. Yet in just a few short hours, he would find himself in desperate need of just that. And the man who would unknowingly become his answer to prayer was Pentagon police officer and Hawaii native Isaac Ho'opi'i. I started running inside the building and gradually grabbing people because most of them were just in shock thinking, hey, you know, what happened? Carried a couple people out, 
as I kept on going back in, I heard people crying out, you know, I'm over here, help me. I could hear people calling out. I went as far as I could because I didn't want to be a casualty, but I also knew that I could have helped them even by just yelling. Kept on yelling, hey, I'm over here, head towards my voice, and come towards my voice. Firefighters warn the officer that if he tries to penetrate further into the blazing building, he might never make it out again. But Isaac refuses to give up. They're calling out, and it feels like it was the last desperation of life for them. So all I could do is just, hey, come towards my voice, head towards my voice. For weeks after the attacks, Isaac is haunted by the sound of the victims' voices. As far as he knows, none of them survived, until he learns about Wayne Sinclair. There was an article in the, the Washington Post that um, his wife had read, uh, repeating the words, you know, if you can hear my voice, here's towards, here towards my voice. And she called me and said, I think it was my husband that, that you heard. Uh, and then she put him on the phone, I talked to him. You could tell that big husky Hawaiian type voice that that was the Pentagon police officer that I had heard. That was my guardian angel that got me out of the building that day. According to Pentagon worker Wayne Sinclair, his prayers were answered and his life was miraculously saved. But for others trapped inside the burning towers of the World Trade Center, help is still desperately needed. In the North Tower of the World Trade Center, Captain Jay Jonas and the men of Ladder Company No. 6 are among the many firefighters ascending the stairs to help those trapped on the upper floors. At the same time, Officer Will Jimeno and Sergeant John McLaughlin of the Port Authority Police are gathering up volunteers to help in the rescue effort. They head for the Trade Center's underground concourse in search of emergency equipment. Joining them are officers Dominic Pizzullo, Antonio Rodriguez, and Chris Amoroso. What the men cannot know is that as they gather up the needed supplies, forces beyond their control are working against them. And within minutes, their whole world will collapse. At the same moment, Stanley Pramnath, whose office in the South Tower was destroyed when the second plane hit, is struggling to free himself from the wreckage. All the partition, all the walls and everything was flattened. Every piece of furniture and computer was all destroyed. And I'm screaming and I'm thinking, God, how can these people be so heartless to leave me to die? How can they do that? Not realizing that I'm by myself on this floor. There's nobody else, nobody. Upon impact, everybody in the 78th to the 82nd floor was gone. A few floors above Stanley, several executives from a brokerage firm are struggling to find their own escape route. Miraculously, they find a stairwell that seems to be undamaged by the plane crash. As they were going down this group of six longtime colleagues, they met an obese woman and a frail man coming up. And the obese woman said, you can't go down. There's too much smoke. There's too much fire. At the 82nd floor in the darkened stairwell, they debated what to do. Most of them went up in search of a helicopter rescue on the advice of the people who were coming below. But there was one executive, an executive vice president named Brian Clark. He just felt down was the place to be. I heard off to the side this banging, bang, 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 help. This faint voice was screaming, but it was faint. Help, is anybody there? I can't breathe, help, I'm buried. Now, the, the fire escape door had blown off the wall a bit on the 81st floor landing, so we were able to push the drywall back. Ron and I went shinnied sideways through this opening in the wall and onto the 81st floor and the smoke was picking up a bit on the 81st floor. And with my flashlight, as I sort of shone it around this darkness, because it was pitch black in there, my flashlight was like a high beam headlight on a foggy country road at night. All you could see was this beam of light in this, the, the, the dust that was kicking up in the air in the black smoke. Hey, in there! Help me! This man that had the flashlight, shining it over his head, 
I can see this light just beaming through, and you know, all around, and he's flashing it. And this stranger's voice was guiding us left and right as we approached him. And then a very strange thing happened. Ron Francesco, who was carrying a gym bag, he was using it somehow to filter the air as best he could. And he started coughing and sputtering and was completely overcome by smoke right beside me. He couldn't go on. And he turned around and he went back to the stairs and he went up. You okay? Ahead of me a few yards, I don't know yet, I haven't found this stranger who's screaming for help, is somebody who's saying, help, I can't breathe. And yet right there around me was this bubble of fresh air. And I cannot explain it other than miraculous. Inside the damaged office, Stanley Pramnath is buried up to his shoulders in debris. As precious seconds pass, the bank executive draws closer and closer to disaster. The idea that the Trade Center towers could fall seems impossible. But as the whole world knows, the towers did fall, and the images of destruction from that terrible day beg the question, how could anyone inside the buildings have survived? The mere mention of the word miracles is bound to get a reaction from almost everyone you meet. Some will tell you they believe in miracles. They may even believe they've had one happen to them. But there are others who scoff at the mere possibility of such a thing. You know, people try to convince themselves that miraculous events are nothing more than cosmic accidents because they do not want to believe in a loving God. There is no such thing as a true accident. Nothing happens outside of God's plan. There's something very thrilling and something very frightening about that. For if we acknowledge that God is really out there acting on our behalf, then it naturally follows that we need to decide how we respond to him. Among the people who were caught in the September 11th terrorist attacks, there were undoubtedly those who believed wholeheartedly in miracles and would attribute their survival to nothing less. Of course, there were others who just that morning would have counted themselves among the skeptics. But regardless of where they stood before the attacks, you can be sure all were praying for a miracle as the morning wore on. Stanley Pramnath is among them. Having lived through the impact of the plane into his South Tower office, he struggles to free himself from a mountain of debris. Suddenly, a light pierces the smoky darkness. And as I'm screaming, Lord, send somebody, anybody to help me. There's this person with a flashlight on the other end of the floor. I can't see the person, but there's this flashlight. I gotta be dreaming here. Something is not right. What are the chances for somebody to have a flashlight at a time like this? I've gotta be dreaming. So I'm crouched and I'm screaming, don't leave me to die. But I'm temporarily deaf because of this sound. And even though this person was responding later on, I knew, I, I couldn't figure it. And I'm thinking all these people who were with me left me to die. This time everybody was gone and impact and I'm by myself. And I decided that I'm gonna crawl as fast as I could from the south end of the building going towards the elevator. One floor is like one acre square, I would say. And I'm crawling as fast as I can. Wait for me, please don't leave me. And I'm crawling the entire length of the loans department through the lounge into the computer room, into the communication room. And there's this wall. Somehow this stranger had come through a maze, if you like, and what now was trapped by a wall. As I got closer and closer, and he was directing me left, right, and I got there. And not two yards in front of me was this hand waving that I suddenly was able to focus on and I went down the arm and there was a wide-eyed stranger with his head sort of sticking out a hole in the wall saying, you know, you know this, is, this is me. I'm gonna have to go to this wall. I'm gonna see if I can't go to the wall. Okay, I'm gonna try and get over the top. 
So I climbed up on some debris and, and sort of went up over the top and looked down and said, the only way out of here is if you go up and over this. Now, you know, this person scrambled up and like a cat almost, but and I reached but couldn't catch it. I said, now you must do this. This is the only way out. Trying to grab on on top of this 10 feet cheat rock wall. It's like a dry wall, partition wall sort of. And I missed. And part of the ceiling caved in and a black sheet rock screw Trying to prevent it from hitting my face, I raised up my hand. It went straight through and got stuck on the other side. And I'm knowing in worse shape than before. So I winced. The man says, what happened? I said, there's a nail in my palm. He says, bite it out. I says, I can't do it. He said, is it attached to a piece of wood? Yeah. He says, hit on the wood. The nail is going to come out. I took the second option, did like this, and the hand ballooned. you got to do this. you got to try again. And up again, the stranger came, and somehow I got underneath an arm and a, and a neck or something, and he says later that I pulled him up like Superman, and up and over we went, and we fell down on my back. He gave me this big kiss as I'm lying on my back, and, and I said, I'm Brian. <laughs> and he said, I'm Stanley, and that's how we met. It's a Stanley Premier. And with my hand still outstretched, his hand had all balloon, black and blue, bleeding and all. This man took my hand, and he held his hand like this. And this man stared me in the eyes, and he told me something that I'll go to the grave with. This man said, he said, all my life I live as an only child. I always wanted a brother, and I find that man today. And his hand, he had a, a gash in his left palm. He took my right hand and did like this, and he rubbed these two hands together, and he says, from today, you're my blood brother. And this man put his hand around my shoulder. He says, come on, buddy, let's go home. All right. Brian Clark risked his own life to save the life of a stranger. Okay? Against all odds, okay. he and Stanley Pramnath emerged safely from the stricken building. And it's not a moment too soon. Because within minutes, the unimaginable disaster of the morning will take an even more deadly turn. At 10.05 a.m., the South Tower of the World Trade Center succumbs to the overwhelming forces against it. One of the few who witnessed the terror up close and lived to tell about it is a man named Sujo John. The plane struck a few floors above ours, but part of the debris of the plane would come in through our floor, fire breaks on our floor, walls were caving around us. As we looked up, there was a huge crater. We could actually see 10 floors directly above ours. But I looked at my watch and I realized it was past 8.45 in the morning. Every normal day, my pregnant wife is on the other tower, on the south tower, at least by 8.40. And what if this plane that has struck my building has hit her building and then hit mine? If that's her story, then there's no way she's gonna come down all those flights. So I'm desperately trying to reach her through my cell phone. I'm borrowing the cell phones of all these folks that were running down the stairwell with me, but none of the cell phones would work because the networks were completely jammed. It took me more than an hour to come down 81 floors of the North Tower. I now reached the plaza level of this building. This plaza would be an open space right in between these towers, a place of fun, a place where people would hang out during lunch and after work. But this place had now become a place of destruction and death as we see hundreds of bodies of, of people who had jumped out of the building, of people in those planes. We see the engine of that plane lying right in the middle of that plaza. As we watch that picture of death, people were literally breaking down, realizing that many who worked in that building along with us didn't have that opportunity that we had to be now getting out of this building. I now hear another explosion. I see dust and fumes racing in towards me. The very building I approached, the South Tower, was finally imploding and going down. When I realized what was happening, I said, God, this is it. You gave me this opportunity to come down 81 floors, but, but death has finally got a hold of me. It was a moment of fear, a moment of confusion, and I said, God, what if this building is gonna go down, and what if I'm gonna die here? Where am I going? Have I lived a life pleasing in God's sight, or have I tried to live my life my way? In that moment of fear and hopelessness, I felt God pour out His peace upon my life, and I felt the Lord saying, Sujo, if you were to die here at the World Trade Center because of your faith and because of your walk, you will make it to this place called heaven. It was a glorious peace that just surrounded me in that moment. I looked around, there were 15, 20 people around me, and the next thing we did, we huddled together. 
I'm on top of men and women. There are men and women on top of me. I couldn't see their faces, neither could they see mine. But there was a verse from the Bible that comes to my mind, Romans 10, 13. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And that verse started speaking to me as if this is talking of the eternal and not on the, not on the physical. On the physical realm, we could all be dead, but this was talking about eternity. And something in my heart, which I know was God, started you know, speaking to me saying, where are these people going without Jesus? And I started crying out Jesus and I asked those 15, 20 people to cry Jesus with me. An amazing thing happens. Those 15, 20 people didn't doubt what I was trying to get through to them. They didn't call upon any other God or try any other form of religion or faith. But as I started crying out Jesus, they would cry Jesus with me for about five minutes. I realized I'm being buried in debris as I fell soot and glass and all kinds of stuff fall on me. After about 20 minutes, I realized I'm still alive. I, as I try to get up, I realize I'm plastered with soot and glass only to realize that those people, they did not make it out alive. Their bodies were smashed and crushed. In the North Tower, Captain Jay Jonas and his men are stunned by the terrible noise of the South Tower's collapse. It was at that time that we heard and felt something that nobody had heard and felt before. Uh, we, we felt uh, an earthquake-like rumble and our building swayed back and forth and the lights went out in our building. About 30 seconds later, they came back on. The North Tower of the World Trade Center will survive a mere 23 minutes longer than its sister tower. And that leaves precious little time for the people still trapped inside, including the men of Ladder 6. By 10 a.m. on the morning of September 11th, the South Tower of the World Trade Center has collapsed into a huge pile of rubble and airborne debris. Inside the North Tower, Captain Jay Jonas and the men of Ladder Company 6 watch it fall. They know it's just a matter of time before the building they're standing in succumbs as well. This whole time I had this, this really sickening feeling in my stomach that we were dead men walking. You know, that, that time is not on our side, we got to move as fast as we can. We kept going down the stairs until we got to the 20th floor. And the 20th floor, there was a woman standing in the doorway. And her name was Josephine Harris. She was a bookkeeper for the Port Authority. She was just standing there. She was crying. And uh, we stopped. And uh, Tommy Falco, one of my firemen, looked at me. He says, hey, Cap, what do you want to do with her? I looked at her. I took a deep breath. And I said, ah, bring her with us. I says, Billy, put her arm around your shoulders. We'll take your tools, and we still stay together. We stay together as a unit. So we started our evacuation down the stairs. But now um, our evacuation, which was, we were literally running down the stairs, is now both feet on the same step, one step at a time. And so our evacuation is very slow. The rescue of Josephine Harris drastically slows the descent of Ladder 6 firefighters. Will their desire to save her cost the men their lives? And we kept going down. We made it to the fourth floor, and uh, Josephine could no longer support her own weight. She fell to the floor. I got just exhausted. I just, I was just tired. I told the fireman to leave me. I just wanted to sit down. You're doing great. Then they hear the sound they've been dreading. I heard a rumble and that's all I heard. The shaking in the building was so violent that it was we were literally being bounced up and down off the floor. Every time a floor hit another floor it, it would create violent vibration and create a loud boom within the building. So it was boom, 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 boom. And that kept, as it got closer, it got louder and louder. We just, uh, we just covered up and hoped for the best. In the streets below the World Trade Center, thousands of people run for their lives. Then as the dust cloud in lower Manhattan dissipates, a surreal landscape emerges. The Twin Towers, symbols of American prosperity, are gone. 
In their place, a city scarred by tragedy and a world filled with uncertainty. All in all, thousands of people from more than 90 countries lost their lives that day. At the same time, unexplainable, some would even say miraculous circumstances were at work. Could it be that life is lingering underneath the rubble? Less than two hours have passed since the first of the terrorist strikes. In Washington, D.C., all federal office buildings are evacuated, and the President of the United States has been spirited away to a secret location. Across the nation, airports are evacuated, and the last of the planes traveling in American airspace are forced to land. In the hours to come, five warships and two aircraft carriers are dispatched to protect the east coast of the United States from further attacks. While America takes steps to protect itself on a grand scale, in New York, the tragedy takes on a very personal meaning for those in search of missing friends and loved ones. Among them is Sujo John. After a miraculous escape from the debris field of the South Tower, Sujo struggles with the knowledge that his wife, who is pregnant with their first child, might not have survived the devastation. As I'm sitting there, I'm saying, God, why have you spared my life? Because for sure my wife is dead. You know, for sure the child she's carrying is dead. So I'm sitting there right in the middle of one of the streets of New York City, angry at God, angry at the circumstances I find myself and my family in, angry at these people, whoever they were, that caused this horrible tragedy upon, upon men and women who had just gone to work and had not gone to war. As I'm sitting there thinking all is lost, I now hear a voice speak to me saying, get up make your way into the store that's right across to you. So as I'm trying to make my way into the store, a young girl from the store, she comes out and she pulls me to the store and she started removing glass from my hair. She gives me water to drink and she says, let me call your family for you. And I said, what family? You know, my wife is dead. This girl took my cell phone and she started going to the numbers stored in my cell phone. And my cell phone rings for the very first time that day in her hands. She hands me back the phone, I, I flip my phone, I see my wife's caller ID and I'm saying, God, this is not her. It's someone else that's got a hold of a phone and, and is trying to reach me with the news that, hey, your wife is dead. I picked up that call thinking that would be the worst news of my life, but when I said hello, it was my wife on the other side. Her life was spared. For Sujo John, the search is over. But for the people trapped in the rubble of the World Trade Center, the ordeal is just beginning. As impossible as it may seem, Port Authority police officers Will Jimeno and John McLaughlin survived the collapse of both towers, but their fate is far from certain. Already, their three colleagues have perished. What's more, Jimeno and McLaughlin are trapped in the debris pile several stories deep and hidden from any would-be rescuers. For hours, the two stricken officers talk to each other in the darkness and try to keep each other's spirits from fading. Then, out of the darkness, there comes a voice. A U.S. Marine searching above them calls into the pit in hopes that someone below might hear them. With all the strength they have left, the Port Authority officers make their presence known. Finding the men in the debris pile was like finding a needle in a haystack, but freeing them from the rubble would be even more impossible. Another building in the World Trade Center complex is on the verge of collapse, and all around them fires are burning out of control. Yet the Marines and rescue workers refuse to give up. Still, after hours of careful work, Officer Jimeno's leg remains pinned. At around 11 p.m., Trauma surgeon Kenneth Testa is brought in to extricate the Port Authority officer. I had gotten out and uh, walked into the pile, and uh, I, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Uh, the rubble pile, it, it had to be at least 75 to 80 feet high from the ground level, and there was a human chain of firemen with hoses and passing medical supplies up this human chain into the pile <clears throat> where they found this first Port Authority officer. And when I finally saw the first victim, I looked down at him and I, I asked him his name. And uh, I, was, I was taken back by the fact that the man was holding a conversation with me. 
because all around me there was there was there was just no signs of life but the emergency workers and you would never think that anybody could survive three or four hours let alone I mean just just survive the collapse of the building then to survive in this 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 dust choking diesel ridden soaking wet environment was amazing and when he looked at me and, and spoke uh, I'll never forget, I mean, that is, that's burned into my brain. I, I asked him what his name was, and he looked up at me and told me his name. And I asked him, you know, where were you? And he told me where he was. And uh, uh, he says, how am I doing? And I said, you are the luckiest man in the world. Was it merely luck that saved the two Port Authority police officers that day? Or was something much more powerful at work? Back at the rescue site, Dr. Testa's job is to free Officer Jimeno through the most drastic of measures, amputation. Adhering to the unwritten code of his profession, Testa knows he must put life before limb. Yet the trauma surgeon can't bring himself to perform the procedure. Five rescue workers await his assessment. He urges them to continue their work for just a few minutes more. And in those last few moments, Officer Jimeno's leg is freed. Against all odds, Will Jimeno and John McLaughlin are rescued. And in circumstances that defy explanation, there are even more survivors in the rubble. What happened? Is everybody all right? Good. We're good here. Moments after the collapse of the World Trade Center's North Tower, 12 firefighters, a police officer, and civilian Josephine Harris open their eyes to view the devastation around them. Trapped in the wreckage of a stairwell, they are stunned to be alive. Are you all right? Are you guys okay? Anything hurt? Is anything hurt? Is anything hurt? Are you guys okay? We're looking around. We're in this stairway that barely even looks like a stairway anymore. It's half filled with debris. The stairwell's twisted. And I gave a quick roll call to see who we still had with us. And um, all my people were alive. Uh, Josephine was alive. Yeah, that was the building. All right, listen, I need a couple of guys to go down below. See how far down you can make it. All right. <coughs> Got it. Okay. <coughs> we're blocked off down here. We can't move. Closed <coughs> off? Yeah. No. All right, we're closed off up here, too. You sure you Do you need How far up have we got? You know what, let's shut off some of these lights. We're going to be here for a little while. Unable to find an escape route, Captain Jonas uses his radio to send out a mayday. This is ladder six. We're in the north tower, B stairwell, approximately the fourth floor. Finally, I gave a mayday message out, and I gave it out a couple times. And then finally, um, somebody replied to me. It was uh, uh, Deputy Chief Tom Haring, a and he was, um, I knew him, he was a battalion chief down here in Lower Manhattan, and uh, he says, okay, ladder six, I have you uh, recorded, you're trapped in the B stairway uh, between the second and fourth floor. So I felt good about that, that as somebody on the outside knew where we were, you know, that, that this was good. The site where the towers once stood is a ghostly wasteland. How could rescuers possibly hope to locate the stranded firefighters inside the wreckage? And even if they find them, will they still be alive? So we, we, we play the waiting game. Ladder six, we are in the North Tower. I kept responding to his radio messages and um, digging in the rubble, somebody found a uh, can of soda. We opened the soda and everybody took a little sip and passed it along. And that was a, that was a huge find. Josephine Harris it was, throughout this ordeal, was very calm. I'm very proud of my guys, how they, that they, without any orders from me or just, they just took it upon themselves to, uh, to take care of her, to comfort her, to talk to her, to keep her mind off 
of what seemed to be impossible surroundings. But then about three, three and a half hours into the, into the collapse, uh, into our entrapment, something happened that, that, that uh, I can still picture it today. It was just like a little ray of sunshine hit the stairway. just looked at it and you could see the, the sunlight with the particles of dust in it and uh, I'm thinking to myself there used to be 110 floors over my head now I see sunshine. As if guided by unseen hands rescuers locate their stranded comrades. One by one they're pulled out of the wreckage. All of them survive. After surviving the unsurvivable, Captain Jonas, Josephine Harris, and the men of Ladder 6 are transported to nearby hospitals for medical treatment. They will join the hundreds of other people injured in the terrorist attacks. People like Jane Doe No. 1, who has undergone eight hours of delicate surgery in an heroic effort to save her life and her badly mangled legs. Listening to the voice within himself, Dr. Ginsberg and his surgical team have accomplished what would seem to be impossible in light of his patient's injuries. But where did that voice come from? And was it the flashpoint of a miracle? And whether you believe it's guided from without or from within or what, but I know with that decision, <laughs> it felt like it wasn't my decision. I was just doing what needed to be done and I asked, I asked for guidance and I got not just guidance, but I got great advice from, from people all around the world who were calling and helping me, and uh, some little internal voice was guiding, too. Amazingly, the reconstructive surgery is successful. Jane Doe's life is not only saved, but she will indeed be able to walk again. Yet as his patient regains consciousness, Dr. Ginsberg is still wondering, who is Jane Doe? And is there someone out there who's hoping to find her? After the surgery, hospital staff go to the woman's bedside and are able to obtain two small but crucial pieces of information, her first name and a telephone number. Dr. Ginsberg makes the call. I'm going to say this is Dr. Ginsberg. I'm at New York Downtown Hospital. We've just operated on a young woman who gave us this name and gave us this telephone number. Does any of this make sense to you? I may have the wrong number. The man who answers Dr. Ginsburg's call is Jane Doe's fiance. Overjoyed at the news that his wife-to-be is alive, he breaks down in tears. When the surgeon learns that his patient is soon to be married, the reason he had to save the woman's legs suddenly becomes clear. She will need those legs to dance at her wedding. The Bible tells us there is a time to be born and a time to die. For Jane Doe, September 11th was not the appointed day. But why? Opinions differ on what made the difference between life and death. Some attribute their survival to good fortune, while others believe that something much greater saved them. The people who did live um, repeatedly tell you, God was looking out for me. Someone was looking out for me. They don't really know why, but God put them in this position and it's caused them to recommit themselves to things that are important in their lives. It's like I had my guardian angel there and there's nobody, nothing can bother me. No harm can come against me. And that's what came out of this whole thing, that there is a God and he hears and he intervenes and he protects and that is what came out of this whole thing for me. I know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. There is God, there is goodness, and there is a guardian angel. This man here, Brian Clark. For me to be alive, there is nothing but God. I mean, from where the place that I got out from, um, you know, it, it just had to be a miracle in the hand of God and nothing else could have.
pulled me out of that. So yeah, it's one thing people get carried away with me on the 81st floor and the plane coming in and all that. But for, as, as far as I'm concerned, the most powerful part of our story is right at the base of that building, as that building was imploding and how you know I managed to get out of that. Uh, people have asked me, uh, says, you know, how could you make that decision? You know, that you were running for your life, literally, and, uh, and you stopped and, and you, you decided to save somebody. And uh, I thought about that and it seems like it was a monumental decision now, but at the time it wasn't. You know, at the time, that's what firemen do. You know, we, we were, you know, we were in severe danger, yes, but somebody else was in severe danger, and our job is to help people. You know, so, uh, you know, we, yes, we did. We put ourselves into harm's way to save her, but uh, that was the that was the theme of the day. You know, that's that's what everybody was doing. The next day, I was so, oh, I, oh, I slowed those men up. I held them back. I, I was, I was afraid to talk to them. And 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 somebody says, no. You you were there for a reason. Imagine if you weren't there, the men would have been on that other stairway with the other, uh, the other one with the 343. It would have been 349. You were put there for a reason, to slow them down. So everything that happened, God knew what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was doing. I didn't know, but he knew. Hope springs eternal, as the old saying goes. But is it possible that the miracles of this life are tied to the hope that people have in their hearts? The survivors of September 11th might say so. But what about the heroes who gave their lives that day? Why were there no miracles for them? We don't always know why someone survives and someone doesn't, but God does. I remember hearing Paul Harvey say he went to counsel a young man who was dying of cancer and the young man looked at him and said, Paul, I don't believe the divine architect of the universe ever builds a staircase that leads to nowhere looks to us like some of those lives that were lost were staircases that lead to nowhere, but not to the divine architect of the universe. He has a purpose for everything. Do miracles still occur today? Did they happen on September 11th? Ultimately, each person must decide for himself what he will choose to believe. But for the people whose stories you've just heard, there is no doubt that God intervened in their lives and save them in a way that can only be called miraculous.